All right, so those of you that were in the last panel, I am an engineer, but I'm also the CTO of Cinemersia. So I had the pleasure of figuring out all of that audio nightmare on how to make that work. Um, be happy to talk with anyone about it after this. It was quite an experience. We have a really cool panel with us. I'm gonna go ahead and have them run down the line and introduce themselves. Hello, I am uh, Chadwick Turner. Seems like there's a lot of USC people, so I am one and all the same. There we go, all right, go Trojans. Um, was in their business cinematic arts program. From there, went to Creative Artists Agency. From there, consulted at 20th Century Fox. From there, went to I Am Global, worked for Stuart Ford. From there, went back to 20th Century Fox. From there, went to Amazon, did business development in their digital space, Fire TV, Fire Phone Launch, etc. All the while, while I was at Amazon, I was shooting with Freedom 360 and 360 Hero Rigs. Um, and then during that entire process, proselytizing virtual reality at, at a big company like Amazon. Uh, and now I'm currently uh, heading content partnerships at uh, Verdeo. Verdeo is a distribution platform that's uh, agnostic. It will be available on all devices that uh, you can enjoy virtual reality on. So, pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Aaron Toman, and I'm the lead engineer at 2-Bit Circus. And uh, we create cinematic VR experiences. Uh, my job is, um, as the lead engineer, I've uh, created custom video stitching software that we use. Um, a lot of the off-the-shelf stuff that we've found uh, hasn't cut it, so we've developed our own. We also create uh, motion platforms and haptics that go along with the experiences. Uh, so that's also a part of my job, is designing those um, motion platforms. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. I'm John Dewar. I went to Chapman Film School. I don't know if there's anyone out there who went there, but that's a cool place. <laughs> and uh, now I'm, uh, I moved on from there. I started doing visual effects. I uh, did a lot of like educational modeling, like uh, Modern Marvels, and a lot of episodes of that. Uh, ended up at an agency out here called Sabretooth, where I switched over to programming and uh, learned Got really good at Action Script 3 and Flash um, just when the iPhone came out and just completely missed that wave. It was very sad. Um, and then that kind of uh, that that kind of led directly to this. Um, I wanted to get back into the filmmaking aspect. And uh, last year hooked up with Kite and Lightning, worked on three projects with them, uh, Sense of Peso, GE Subsea, and The Voice 360. And then I uh, formed a new studio with my uh, friend and collaborator Aaron Nicholson um, and the two of us have started a company called Studio Transcendent which is also a VR content studio. Um, we're actually focused on real-time graphics so uh, we generally are using Unreal Engine for everything and um, our first demo is not yet publicly released but it will be released shortly so uh, we can look forward to that. Check it out because it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Matt Collado from Little Star. I'm Chief Content Officer. Uh, Little Star is a destination for immersive content, so we're working with producers and brands from all around the world to deliver VR 360 experiences. Um, you can view the videos on the web, use the arrows and mouse key to control. Uh, we have native apps support on both Android and iOS. You can download the both apps in the store. Has Google Cardboard support on both, as well as accelerometer and touch control to look around. Our Gear VR app was just recently um, approved by Samsung. It's being featured in the Oculus Store right now. So you can download that and check it out. And um, if anybody here is creating VR or 360 or thinking about doing it, we should talk. Right on. Hi, I'm Christina Heller. I'm the CEO of VR Playhouse. There's a bit of a crossover from Dylan on the last panel to me here today. Um, we are a creative studio that does immersive cinematic content for virtual reality headsets. We are platform, software, and hardware agnostic, which means we just use the best tools for the job. Our sole focus is trying to tell the best, the most interesting, the coolest experiences in VR. And in addition to the first person project that Dylan was talking about in the last series, uh, the last panel, which is an episodic narrative where you're being John Malkovich style inside this guy's head as he's going through the intimate and emotional experience in his experiences in his life. We are also we also did a um, partnered with Red Bull on a really cool experience that's coming out very shortly. We are doing a travel series called Vicarious. We went down to Nicaragua and shot for 10 days with 
the cameras down there and came back with a ton of footage that we are still in post-production on. So I have a lot of great insight on that process for you guys. Um, and, and yeah, and we're going to Nepal actually um, in a couple of weeks to do some filming there um, with a relief organization that's like Doctors Without Borders. So hearing from the varied backgrounds that y'all have of distribution, content production, engineering, I'm interested to see what are each of you most interested about. This can be AR, VR, something you've worked on, something you're hoping to see soon, or even an industry that VR hasn't gotten into yet that you're interested in seeing. We can start right here next to me, Chad Wick. Uh, sure, yeah, my background is once I went to USC Film School, but it turned out I had to pay for it myself, so I decided to transition to a business film degree. Um, from there though, uh, you know, I've just always kind of kept myself in the production mindset, but recently, uh, two and a half years ago, I met my wife. I met her father, and her father has been suffering brain cancer for 18 years. He's supposed to live six months, and the guy just has a lot of brain to give. He's a brilliant man, MIT, Peace Corps member, was in India, Cape Town, and around that time, it was about six months after the Oculus Kickstarter, and I was like, there's something there. And then three, you know, 360 Heroes, GoPro, was like, oh my God. So I asked him, one day, I literally met him uh, two weeks after I started dating my wife, and he was like, what do you want to do more than anything else? And he's been in the hospital ever since. He said, I want to leave this room. I was like, okay, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got the Oculus over here, we got the GoPro, okay, where do you want to go? He said, Paris. So I proposed very quickly to my wife, actually, and then the following year, we went to Paris and Amsterdam and filled it, filmed it for him, rendered it, stitched it, learned as best I could with video stitch and in Colorado Pound of Video, and, and it was amazing to give him the ability to see the world again. So, yeah, I'm stoked to see Batman in 360. Oh my God, Star Wars, all these things that I grew up loving, but I think one thing that needs to be emphasized more than anything else is it gives a lot of people that don't have windows to the world access. So there's a lot of comments that have gone out of, is it gonna make us less social? Is it gonna be, it, may, maybe some people, but some people it gives them an, an access to the world. It doesn't have to be medical disabilities or anything. It, it could be monetary. Some people can't see the loop. They'll never see the loop, but now they can with their smartphone. So that's the thing that excites me more than anything else about this platform is it opens the world to everyone. Um, I'm most excited about the real-time stitching that's going to be coming about. Um, at 2-Bit Circus, we've developed uh, real-time stitching software. So um, mostly we use that for pre -vis. When we're doing shooting, we can actually see what we're capturing in real time. There's about a one-second uh, latency in the whole thing. So. Um, I'm really excited about people being able to go to concerts or, you know, sporting events or, um, but most importantly, being able to like connect with other people. I'd like to go down and visit my, my parents in Mexico. Um, so the only way that I can do that right now is with a plane ticket and time, which I don't have at work. So I'd like to be able to just uh, strap on a, an Oculus and be able to be in the living room at my parents' house. So I think that it's that uh, like he was mentioning, there's a lot of people that are saying that it, it's kind of isolating experience, but I feel like the future is going to bring about um, a more uh, uh, more kind of a bonding experience potentially. Um, I, I guess that I'm most interested in virtual reality because I think as a storyteller, that's the medium for storytelling that's going to immerse you completely and you know, put you into another space and give you this emotional experience. Um, AR, I think, is going to be really cool from, you know, obviously from an engineering perspective, an application perspective. But my personal opinion is it's going to be a long time before it gets into a form factor that is going to be consumer friendly. Um, HoloLens is amazing, but I don't think it's consumer friendly form factor yet. So. Um, I'm really excited about the next wave of content that I think we're going to start to see. Um, right now, we're seeing a lot of, you know, the fly on the wall type of stuff, the fast and loud stuff, attached GoPro rig to your helmet while you're going down a snowboard. Um, the next wave of content that we're going to start to see is going to be more narrative based, more, you know, storytelling involved. People like VR Playhouse and Speculate Theory back there, Morris and Studio Transcendent are doing, you know, really great projects in education and first person and narrative. And I just think it opens up a new way of, you know, learning and experiencing the world. And we're only 
you know, at the tip of the iceberg right now when it comes to content in VR. It's sort of like if you can think, if you can dream it, go and shoot it. And they were talking about it on the other panel, you know. <clears throat> there are no standards, really. It's like you got to go out there and do it, fall down, figure out your stitch lines, all that stuff. It's, it's a work in progress. It's a little bit like the Wild West right now. So if you have an idea, go out there and do it, and there's going to be somebody that's going to watch it. So when you put on the headset, it's like the closest thing to real life that we have without actually being in real life. So I'm pretty excited about drugs without drugs. <laughs> you know, like put it on and whoa, crazy. Um, I'm also, and this is a little bit outside of VR Playhouse, but I'm really excited about um, the therapeutic applications for this. I mean, if we can create simulations for people, um, I think it could help people with phobias and insecurities kind of overcome them. And I think that that's really interesting. I've kind of been personally engaging a, um, a famous psychiatrist about like just beginning that conversation of what are some of these experiences that we can do. Um, so, so yeah. Very good. So another thing that I know a lot of people want to know is what are some of the challenges that y'all have come up to? And what are challenges presented to virtual reality as a medium? And this is open to anyone who'd like to comment. Okay, so <laughs> when where do people, we start? Where do we start? So when people are, a lot of times when people talk about um, production for virtual reality, they're like, they think about the cameras. They're like, you know, just buy a Freedom Rig and six GoPros and go. And it's like, guys, the cameras and the, and the shooting is like 25%. Uh, the real hard stuff comes in the post-production. Um, and we've learned that we learned this the hard way. I mean, we went down to Nicaragua, we were super fresh, super new, and we were like, oh, we're just gonna shoot tons, like almost like documentary style. And then we came back and we realized that we had to like deal with all of it. Um, storage issues are huge. Uh, hard drive space. We just built a um, 112 terabyte hard drive storage center at our house just to be able to wrangle all the stuff that's coming in. Our computer processing has been has had to like uh, we've had to up it considerably. I we were Macintosh users up until this point. I had really high end Macs, and the first time I tried to stitch something on my Mac, I was like, "Why isn't it working?" I felt like I had mittens on. Um, so then, uh, so now we've built custom PCs, uh, workstations to to handle the the footage. So um, and and. To, like the rendering times on this stuff is insane. Like we were, we're rendering something out for a partnership with Discovery that we're doing this week for New Fronts. We're doing, it's just a simple Joshua Tree time lapse. We threw a couple effects on it to make it look a little bit better. We're talking like one, two day renders on this stuff. So, you know, if you render something and you realize that you made a mistake, you're like, all right, I've got to do it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and to that point, it's also like, at a certain point in the video, if you see that the parallax is off or the stitch is off, you got to go to that exact frame and go and clean that up. So the post production yeah. is certainly the heaviest part. Totally, and then on top of it, like there's really an, there, uh, we're using uh, t tools that were built for other purposes. One thing that my my husband and co-founder of VR Playhouse likes to say is that everything in VR is just hacked together garbage, and it does feel like that sometimes. Um, but uh, so like, you know, you can use Autopano, the color program, which is probably, I think, the best, most user friendly software out there. And, at, and, and, and if you shoot it correctly, sometimes you can push stitch and Autopano and poof, ah, oh, perfect. But often that's not the case. And so then you have to take it into After Effects or another program like that to like, you know, really work on those little trouble areas. Um, one thing that uh, we do at uh, Tubit Circus is uh, we do a lot of filming of uh, action sports. So we've done an IndyCar experience, we've done uh, NFL, we've done um, NBA. We're about to do uh, the Olympics, the USOC training. And our biggest problem is moving the camera because we wanna give as much as we can the first person experience with all of these. We, um, but it's, it, of course it's much easier to use a static camera and um, a lot of people have chosen to go exclusively with a static camera because moving the camera tends to make people sick. But uh, our goal, and um, we've been pretty successful with it, is moving the camera and moving it sometimes very, very quickly. So uh, that's kind of one of the things that, uh, that we're dealing with. But um, So the question's been asked pretty frequently during this convention, where do you see VR going? And 
I'll ask that similar question, but with the caveat of how do we get there? Like, what would you, from your background, recommend be done, or what can you be doing as a content producer sitting in the audience to get us to that point? I'll take a quick shot at that answer. Um, I think a lot of the times people have been mentioning, oh, it's, it's, we've all read the articles, it's a 15 minute experience. It's experiences, you, narratives are tough. I think that for anybody that's a student of film history, we're in the Lumiere Brothers stage, we have trains coming at the screen and the entire audience is screaming, not understanding what to do and Nickelodeons, those kind of moments. And then eventually you get to a point where they're consuming it 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. And it takes those, it, it's not just like they'll arrive there. You have to have content creators make in a compelling experience that accommodates what the audience is used to, but also pushes their boundaries. So I think that's one of the most important aspects here is to understand that where we're going, film's been around for over 100 years. We, we're going to get to some really crazy stuff 100 years from now. But over the next six months, we're just in this Lumiere phase where now we have people like VR Playhouse, you know, Specular, obviously, all these people that are out there pushing the limits. Um, I'm excited to see those, those, that first great narrative that is long form. I mean, I think we're going to get there. It just takes time. Maybe it's manslaughter. Huh? 15 minutes. I'm ready. August 15th. I'll jump in. Money. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Like, the technology is there. The companies are there. The vision is there. It's the money. I mean, like, if, to make the drugs without drugs, you need money. So, um, uh, the, the, I, I, right now, we're definitely seeing some brands that are stepping up to the plate and, and making some big investments in the space. Some of the studios are making some interesting ancillary content to go um, along with them, some of their major motion picture releases this year. Um, we're seeing the budgets are getting like you know incrementally bigger, and that's exciting. But you know, it's interesting that like a million dollars for a VR experience is still considered like a really like really like a coup. Like yeah, you got that. And then you compare that to like an indie film, and you're like. That's nothing. So um, I think what what's really going to get us there is the in, is is the people with the money finally taking the risk and starting to invest in these projects so that we can experiment in this medium and really push it. You know. Yeah, I I agree with uh, what both other panelists said. I think content is certainly going to push this forward if we get you know, I don't know, like a Rihanna concert or things like that. But more so than just being in the headsets, I think mobile there was a you know talk the other night about mobile first or mobile the gateway to vr so you know you can download the little star app right now and have a light vr experience and put it right in the cardboard and i think you know dodo case and google cardboard is going to be the point of entry for a lot of people their first vr experience whether their friend has it or they're at some event where it's there and they try it on and then they're going to be like oh this is real. Now I can spend a little bit more money to buy a headset. And, you know, as these start to become more accessible, they're already becoming cheaper. I think that's also going to, you know, push the medium forward. To add to that as well, there's a certain element in the general population. Everybody here is aware that cell phones, the Note 4 with the Gear VR, et cetera. But when I explain to people that have smartphones that it's not just Oculus Rifts that are going to be pushing VR forward, that in fact, there's a good chance that the phone in their pocket with a Google Cardboard or a Dodo case, something like that, could enjoy VR content today. They're surprised by that. So there's gonna be a moment where there's great content that everybody says they need to enjoy. Their friend will explain that their iPhone 6, their Note 4, et cetera, that's in their pocket today can use it. They will then download, uh, you know, Little Star, they'll enjoy it on Vridio's web VR platform. You can have, um, it's just gonna be this coalescent moment where everybody's just gonna kind of get it at once. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things about VR right now is there's people just need to understand how it functions. You know, my mom still doesn't know exactly what I do, but she supports me nonetheless. <laughs> like a, we call them like can't miss cultural moments. And I think, I don't know that we've seen that yet, that one. And it's, it's so surprising, like when you show somebody, you know, just 360 video on the phone for the first time and they're like, oh my God, their mind is blown. And then forget about it. You put them in one of these and it's a whole yeah. other story. I kind of want to go maybe further into the future with this question because, I mean, I think that we have had versions of immersive cinema, you know, they were stuck in theme parks and there was no real democratization. It was a very expensive thing to try to experiment with, which is what we now have an affordable way to experiment with it. But ultimately what's going to separate virtual reality from what we've done before in a big way is the fact that we're gonna have the ability to do not just a nodal capture from a rig, but we'll be able to actually 
capture an entire 3D scene and move around inside of it in a physical way, you know, where you're embodying an, av an avatar or just a point and walking around the scene yourself. And that's going to be the thing that really is different, that has never been done before or been available to people in any kind of way that they could experience before. Because up till now, up till the HTC Vive, if you wanted to get the experience of walking around inside of a virtual space, you had to spend at least $30,000 plus develop your own software or spend $200,000 and get someone else's solution, you know, military grade solution. So that's, I think, to me, the really exciting future tech. Very good. And I know, John, you use uh, Unreal Development Kit mainly, and I've been using Unity a lot mainly. Crytek's coming up with their new engine, or rather they're working on their older engine. Is gaming or our game engines the best way to be doing this now, and will they continue to be in the future? I mean, that's the right now that's your only option. If you want to have the ability to, to move around within the scene, you have to run it in a game engine. I've seen some experiments where people have managed to do a real volume video capture. Um, just, I think, just one that looked anything close to decent. And, you know, so that's more of a future tech thing that's a long way off. Um, if you want to get that experience now, a game engine will get you there pretty efficiently. It's, you know, it's pretty easily. Mm -hmm. But then getting video into that is difficult. Um, we were just, I was just up in Spokane um, this morning. We're working with uh, Cyan on abduction which is their, their new game that they kick-started. And they couldn't afford to put in 3D avatars um, because of the production cost for that. It's very expensive to animate, um, you know, to model the human realistically and animate them realistically and have them be convincing characters. So we actually filmed them. Um, and they're not locked in any way. They can move around the scene and, and view it from any angle. So they have a pretty interesting solution for that. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of an effect, right? So it's not the same thing as there's just somebody in the scene very convincingly rendered. Now for our demo, we built an air show um, called Rapid Fire, and you're standing on the runway, and we developed this technique of filming 3D people in order to have the, like an Air Force captain standing next to you on the runway explaining what was happening to you. And that's extremely convincing, but it only works because we locked your position in, in one spot, right? You, you can't move around beyond what the DK2 allows you to kind of lean in that one meter by one meter volume. So it works really well for that, but, you know, we, we need a lot of new technology if we want to get actors into it without, you know, going through the whole motion capture, facial capture um, technology. But I don't know which technology will get there first because volume video capture or really good digital humans, they might end up getting developed at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. Very good point. So can I get uh, a show of hands, kind of how many people are curious or want to ask questions so I can make sure that we have enough time? This is the last day. I want to make sure everyone that has a hand up gets their question answered. OK, so I want to go ahead and wrap up my line of questions to you all with if we have content creators, uh, engineers, distributors, anyone in the audience, what is your one piece of advice to them, one sentence? from your background that you would give to them? And we'll start out with Chadwick. Uh, I think some people have already said it, but just go out there, gorilla style, and just keep pushing forward. The money's gonna come. Don't worry about that. There's a lot of people in the space. There's a lot of conversations going on that you can't just proselytize at events like this, but there's going to be a lot of opportunities. So becoming a subject matter expert in this field, don't listen to anybody that's saying, I know one sentence, don't listen to anybody saying that this is, oh, is VR going to be something? Is AR? Yes. Yes, it will. It'll be very, very big. Um, yeah, I, I think that getting out there and just going for it, just hit the ground running, and um, it's going to be difficult. It's it's not easy, and it seems like it's going to be much easier when you start off, but uh, um, it gets easier, and uh, yeah, just keep going for it. Um, I'd say don't forget about your bandwidth costs if you're thinking about <laughs> <laughs> delivering it yourself. Um, on, on the Senza Peso, we found that the bandwidth costs got very expensive very fast, and some people were having trouble getting the experience downloaded who were in like Europe or whatever because we had it on Amazon, but we didn't have 
the CDN turned on because we calculated the costs and it would double our cost to turn on the CDN. So you may want to, you know, just don't forget about that step. You may need to find a partner to do that, that for you because the budgets could get into the thousands of dollars very fast if you have a hit. I would say um, just because you can shoot it in 360 or VR doesn't mean you should. So <laughs> just think about that when you're out there shooting because, and you're not going to know that unless you go out there and do it or, you know, at least think about it like Rodrigo on the last panel was saying, he doesn't frame it here, frames it here, you know. So just think about that when you're thinking about your stories and your narratives like or anything that you're going to be shooting. Just because you can have the access in a 360 camera there it doesn't mean it's going to look good. If you're interested in uh, becoming a producer of 360 content, spend your money on the computers and the hard drives, not the camera equipment. You, If you live in Los Angeles, you can rent 360 cameras from Radiant Images. Um, they, as far as I know, are the only rental house in Los Angeles right now that's renting 360 gear, but they have a number of um, cameras you can rent. Spend your money on, a, on at least an Alienware laptop. If you can get a better computer than that, do that and buy tons of hard drive space because that shoot that, you, that you're imagining in your head is going to be two days. You're going to be working on your footage for another two weeks to two months. So um, that's where I would in encourage you to make your investments and it's a little bit counterintuitive, I think, to what most people think but it's definitely the way to go. Yeah, I just want to add to that because she's absolutely right, but like file management is huge as well. Yes. If you're dealing with, you're dealing with, you know, a GoPro rig, rig with six or more GoPros, you know, you got to deal with all that content. It's not one camera. And when you're shooting, be very aware of stitch lines. Um, you know, like when, when you're dealing, you know, you've got basically, let's, let's use a six camera setup just uh, for simplicity. You've got six cameras. Make sure that your camera is facing the subject that you want it to face and that it's pointed directly at them. And if you're working with actors, encourage them to work inside those lanes. Um, and then if they're um, going to move, try to get them to move further away from the camera because the closer they get, the harder it is to stitch. So if you're going to like block some movement, have them move like 10 like five to ten feet away from the camera but really it's much easier if you can just have them sort of stay in that one lane yeah and, and don't get hung up on getting you know the 8k camera with the perfect prime lens you know because all of that is way beyond the resolution of the hmds right now so you just you know a gopro is way more than enough at this time that's great thanks y'all let's go ahead and open up to questions yes sir Um, well, if you want to move the camera, it, the biggest thing is you don't want to like turn the camera and force the person to to turn unless you do it in kind of smooth lines. So for example, uh, we did the uh, Verizon, in, in conjunction with Verizon and Wasserman, we did the something with the NFL and we, we were able to do a punt return and we had a, um, an electric vehicle that was transporting our camera down the field. And we found that you can move the camera in kind of these uh, smooth serpentine arcs. And that is that kind of works OK. Um, the the un other thing that helps a lot is the introduction of motion to the person. So if you can um, actually physically move the person while they're in the VR experience, that helps a lot too because your inner ear is 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 always uh, kind of uh, checking in with your body, and and if those aren't if those systems aren't congruent, you experience motion sickness. So, you know, in indie car experience, we had a, a motion seat that would throw you around, and you would feel the rumble strips, uh, we, and and you really don't have the same nausea. I mean, if you watch it without the motion seat, you kind of get a little bit of nausea, but with it, it's fine. Next question. Yes, sir. Stereoscopic uh, challenges, 
Yeah, you talked about, you, you brought this up on the last panel. I'm actually not so sold on stereoscopic. I've got to tell you, I've watched a lot of VR experiences and, and I'm very sensitive to motion sickness, to, to anything that like messes with your brain. If I watch um, even some really high-end stereoscopic that's been done, after five minutes, I have a headache. Um, I think that Felix and Paul are doing 3D really well, but they're not shooting, I think, in stereoscopic. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty much, for now, on the high resolution mono team. We have done some things where we've rotoed and turned 2D into 3D in post, and I think that that's nice and it allows you to go like this without, without your eyes crossing. Um, but right now I think that, yeah, I think that high resolution mono inside the headset looks pretty good and, and almost 3D. Like I, I watched something we shot, the Red Bull thing, and I was like, this looks 3D to me. Yeah, so no that's one can I'm, tell. Yeah. yeah. If, <laughs> Definitely, lighting is very important, um, and and we are exploring like new rigs that do better in low light. You know, the GoPros. That is one of the biggest frustrations with them is the low light work. So, yeah, we we started off with uh, we did the IndyCar experience in 3D, and it it worked out really well. But we after that we were just like I don't know. There's Especially with like the Gear VR, you lose half the resolution if you want to do 3D stuff. So, is you on higher resolution or 3D? And um, something that I think a lot of people going in don't realize is if you have one of these 3D 360 rigs, you are really limiting yourself as to how close you can get to your subject. Um, because in order to do 360, you have to have your cameras 64 millimeters apart in pairs, pointing different directions and that means that they're more spread apart from the center. And the closer they are to the center, the better your stitching is going to be with objects that are close up. So the further apart they get, the worse. So if you have more pairs of stereo cameras in this circle, you know, you can't actually get things to stitch automatically past like six or seven feet away. And, it, you know, depending on how your rig is, like if you have a really big rig with really fancy cameras that you're getting, you know, it's even harder. So that turns into a huge manual fixing process if, if you want to try and get it closer. And at some point, it's just going to break down. Yeah, so and that's part of the reason why 3D 360 doesn't work really well if you're just trying to do this kind of basic idea of, of stitching your eyes, you know, making two spherical things. You're not trying to do like a light field or something fancy like that. Um, that's part of the reason why it's not super compelling at this point next to the 2D version because you have to push things back and then you lose that really cool 3D effect you get from having things up close. And the, and the 3D breaks down on all the seams as well. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, two questions. So what brands are starting to do this? Well, we worked with Red Bull. I mean, we've seen a few experiences. Mountain Dew did one. Red Bull's done one. Converse. Yeah, Dos Equis. Um, we did the the voice. Yeah. Where, where would you find them online? Um, <laughs> a lot of a lot of the branded content is being are in like the brand's apps. So like Converse launched like a branded experience app where you can see their 360 videos, um, and then either on Little Star or Viridio, I mean, eventually, I think the brands will start putting their content there. Yeah, and you, a, lot of those, a lot of the content that you saw, like Game of Thrones, the HBO, is, it will ascend the wall. It's an application, so it, it's on PC, so if you have a DK2, you can enjoy it. But for the Android, iOS marketplaces, if, they, if there's plans to you know, port it, fantastic. But a, a lot of the times, if you go to like, the original, a lot of the original branded content you'll find on shared.oculus.com, um, there's just a lot of first movers in that space, but those you can check out some examples there. There's quite a bit of it on the Gear VR in the just yeah. in the uh, sample content they give you, and also in the Samsung store. Um, Kite and Lightning has their insurgent experience on the Samsung section. Did you say that again? I couldn't hear you. Really? The uh, so when you get a Gear VR, there's a, a SD card it comes with, and it has a bunch of um, sample video branded content. If you look in the 360 videos app. And just searching on the cardboard store, there's quite a bit of stuff up there. Um, Volvo has one, and I think Mercedes. Very good. Yes, ma'am. So I really like the comments uh, by Teller on the 
spiritual drugs. Can you go a little further into that? What are your ideas for it? How are you like, Sure, okay. sure. Well, one of the things. Well, they they do they, they say that like um it affects your neural path pathways in the same way that like real life or memories affect your neural pathways. I mean, one thing that we were discussing just in terms of a project that we can do right now is taking some of those really cool Joshua tree time lapses we have and then having then um, some like hallucinogenic ge geometric shapes start to come out of the um, out of the the scenery. So I mean, that that's fun. And then even in the Red Bull thing that we're making. Um, so we went down, we, what we were doing is we documented this thing called the circuitry of night, which was a four story cube with interactive projection mappings going on all around it. And then inside the cube, they were doing concerts. And so what we're doing is um, taking you between the real life things that were happening, like the bands playing in the cube, and then all of a sudden you get absorbed into the projection mapped animations. So you're going between animations to real life and then moving inside some of those animations. So it's pretty trippy and fun. Um, because I, you know, I think that, like, you know, that's one of the things that you get to do in virtual reality is take reality, but then heighten it with film tools and animation and stuff like that. So if you have like the wish list five years in the future for beyond drugs, <laughs> should I name the drugs? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, guys. I didn't mean to get you into this quagmire. <laughs> um, <laughs> we may have to move on from that one. I don't know if there's a good answer to that question. Talk to me after the panel. Yeah, sounds good. Legalized right. VR. Next question. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Probably the easiest solution now is um, uh, Nuke has a internal build that has a bunch of tools for working with stereo, and uh, you can get in touch with them and ask for a. Uh, I heard. I guess I read the other day. You can get in touch with them and ask for an advanced copy of that. Um, it's just uh, beta test it for them. What's the module? Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, it's VR tools, I think, something like that. It's not in the uh, not in the current. Yeah, we've been talking with Nuke, version. and I don't think that it's quite ready yet. They've been we kind of going back and forth with them on that. So okay, so I don't know. But yeah, Nuke I think will be a, a great solution for these problems coming up. So yeah, I've already been using just the the current version of it, um, and just as an experiment. I downloaded the trial and I I used it to do some spherical out because you can work. I was working as a cube map. And then just used Nuke to easily convert the cube map into a into a spherical out because they have a node that does that really fast. Next question, yes, sir. Uh, you know, most of this is limited um, on the audio side because of the headphones. Um, what format of audio are you using for most of them? What are you well, right now we're doing a lot. I really liked what the woman on the last panel was talking about of just like really playing with traditional sound design. I mean, it's it headphones are kind of the best way to listen to audio. So you can really play with um, sound inside them. So, you know, there's as opposed to doing 360 capture live capture, we've been doing more um, of the effects in post. So and then and, and to, you know, just like a traditional sound sound design would be on a film or a TV show. Yeah, I think sound design, and uh, I'm seeing people that are recording with like binaural microphones to give that effect as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, um, you, you can do um, the HRTF, the binaural audio processing on it, um, but you'd have to record your sound with that in mind. So it's not not as easy as uh just setting a microphone there and capturing the environment you, you need to have you know lapel mics on all the people and record you know record everything with that in mind so you have clean audio sources that you can put out in space where you want the audio to come from with with all of our production we've done uh post-production sound design and uh pretty much faked all of the sound in it it's pretty much the easiest thing 
Okay. One, I, one, one more yeah, point on that is um, for our air show experience, we also experimented with um, doing a multi-channel out. So we have noise canceling headphones and then we also have a, a speaker that goes, points at your chest and a rumble pack on the floor. So when the airplane comes by, you, like, you feel it in your chest, you feel it on your feet, but you can't really hear these because they're only doing low frequencies and you've got the noise canceling on, which are pretty good at blocking low frequencies. So that's a kind of a fun experiment. Yes, sir. What's the specific editorial programs you're using? And just is there a low end version that someone could use to kind of get an understanding? And just to talk a little bit about the file management issues, you're talking about the huge amount of data coming in. Any suggestions how to handle that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, Autopano is the one to start with, or Video Stitch. Um, Video Stitch only works with NVIDIA graphics cards, not AMDs. So depending on your computer setup, you might not be able to use it. But uh, there's Video Stitch in, in, in Colors Autopano, which just, just got bought by GoPro. I'm sure everybody knows. But um, So those are the two to start with. Also, um, the Adobe Creative Suite is, is pretty good. We do a lot in After Effects. Then we bring it into Premiere, and we do editing in there. Um, uh, we haven't started using Nuke yet, but we've been having a lot of conversations about using Nuke down the line, but I think that that's pretty high. That's like, that's like pretty intense. So yeah, to start off with, I think that just, do you guys know if Autopano has just like a trial version yeah, or? Yeah, it's watermarked. You can download both Video Stitch yeah. and Autopano. Okay. Check them out, watermarked. Are you using a strange like monitor configuration, like a circular monitor? How are you? It looks, around? it looks like a, a video panorama when it's done. Yeah. It, We've we we found a way to like plug in the rift so that we can view in real time the stitch, but that took us a little while. Honestly, what we were originally doing was just like looking at the panorama and then trying to figure it out and then rendering like two seconds of it, testing it, going back and doing it that way. And to speak to uh, Auto Pano, so there's video and there's Giga, so the full suite of it. If you render and you stitch it, you're going to be doing that video, but to adjust the center point. And all you have to have Giga, so it's a little ecosystem there. Um, check them both out; they're both available for download, and you can, you can play with them. But there's two softwares on that front that you need to use. One allows you to stitch. All, let's use the six camera example. Six cameras, they're stitched. Then you can actually adjust and manipulate them in the software called Giga. So. And file management is just like be diligent, be organized. You know, like really really be organized because you're going to be dealing with a lot of takes and you're going to be dealing with a lot of cameras. So, um, you know, just be anal. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. 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 <laughs> and the other thing is I would say, um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but I like to organize my files by takes because that's how yeah. you, that's how you dump them into the editing software. So like all six take one of all six cameras. So organize them by, t by takes and not by camera. Yeah. And, an easy way, so GoPros, if you've ever used them, especially six at a time with like 30 different shots, at the end of your shoot, there's a chance that not all the cameras will say the same number. So the easiest way for myself, like let's say one says 28 and the rest say 30, I have 28 takes that I can potentially use. An easy way to verify what's going on is last modified, let's use Windows as an example. Last modified, just arranged by that, you can simply look at the length itself. You know, this was, Three minutes and 12 seconds, cam one, cam one, underscore, shot one, underscore, angle one, and then you just adjust that accordingly with all six cameras. 360 Heroes also has a cam management software tool that you can play around with. So if you buy one of their rigs, they actually have um, software to help manage this a little bit better. So you can check that out. And if you can get all the GoPros set up to one remote, awesome. Yeah. They, they're kind of a pain, though, and they don't always do that. But if you can get them set up one remote so you can push record at the same time, that's good. Otherwise, I recommend doing a twist at the beginning and also a, a firm one clap. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and then also bring a USB charger because your cameras will last longer than your remote. So if you have synced them to your remote and your remote's dead, congratulations, you are back to square one. So bring a USB charger, Jockery. I worked at Amazon, we have a great deal. $39.99, you can get yourself a great USB charger. It'll save your life. Every time we provide a camera to somebody, I explain why there's more than just a camera, but that it's a great way to ensure that you can sync everything. Yeah, that and um, just when you're using the Wi-Fi, well, first you can control up to 50 GoPros with one Wi-Fi remote. Um, the other thing is though, when you have the Wi-Fi on the GoPros, it drains the battery a lot faster. So I usually do it manually and then you sync the cameras by rotating your hands and then a clap. 
Um, and then if you are going to do it powered by Wi-Fi, you can buy external battery solutions that you can run down, you know, with, with a USB ports and then be able to run for hours at a time. I know VR Playhouse has a battery wow. solution that they the call the batteries. Yeah. yeah. That and they call the wand that they can shoot for 10 hours in the field running around. So if you want to know more about that, talk to Christina. In addition to the battery solution, if you buy six extra batteries and have one of those rubber things from your Nintendo Wii, it fits perfectly six GoPro batteries. <laughs> so you can repurpose. There's a lot of great, and it's beautiful. It actually protects them quite well. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind. One other thing too is if you want to uh, say battery and you don't want to use the remote, one thing that we've done is you, uh, you take a cardboard box and you put mylar on the inside of it and you put that over your camera rig and then you stick a flash inside of there and you flash it and then all of your cameras mm -hmm. get a flash at the exact same moment. So that's really handy as well. That is a great idea. That is a good idea. I like well it. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> That was about the most practical information I've gotten in, in three minutes right there. That was <laughs> spectacular. Right, let's move on. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, forgive me if this is already asked in a different way, but what are the real cost differentiators when you're like looking at getting to the best quality uh, experiences versus just playing around? Like really where where are the where are the costs and why why do like the best you know the most popular VR creators getting so much money to make it, but there's a sense that people can also just like create shit at home. So I say it's in the post production. I mean, it's pretty easy to make a like mediocre 360 video, you know. Um, but it's going to have stitch errors and and that kind of thing. If you want something that's really high resolution and and perfectly stitched, it takes time. And and also to be honest, just the equipment that you're going to need to be able to churn it out. I mean, that's a pretty huge investment. So that's so I think that like there's people who are kind of approaching this as professionals and going into clients and going, okay, yes, I can deliver you a perfect a perfect um, experience and I can get it to you in six weeks. Um, and if you're going to take on more than one client, you're going to need, you're going to need, you know, workstations to do that. And that costs money. So I think that that's why it's sort of the, the creative studios are charging what they are, even though like, you know, anybody in this room could buy a camera and an Alienware and do it. Uh, you're just going to be moving much more slowly and, um, and maybe not getting quite the, the results that a client would demand or need for their brand. In addition, if you're trying to future-proof your content, the six camera rig requires a 1440p, so it's still HD. The HMDs today, can you can enjoy it just, like it's, it'll be perfect for it. But let's say two years from now, you still want that content to kind of live on. You have to potentially build your own uh, or invest in maybe the 10 camera rig, which comes with its own pros and cons, but you can up it to 30 frames per second, 2.7K, I think 15 frames per second, 4K, right? So 1440 to 27, so now we're starting talking about higher resolutions. However, and I'm assuming VR Playhouse and all the other guys, if you ever played with one and you guys can speak to it even better than I can, the parallax issues on those rigs and the ghosting, et cetera, um, they kind of compound on themselves because it's a seven camera array on the horizon line, one or two on the top or one or two on the bottom. And I saw my dad's a helicopter pilot, we took it up and geez, 10,000 feet this way, one foot this way, there were just black, black areas everywhere because of it. But the six camera rig wouldn't have had that, but a lower resolution. So options, lots of options. All right, next question. Yes, sir. Uh, wondering about the size of your uh, final output and how you are distributed. I know you didn't start in the US and stuff, but like, if you put it into an app, is there a, is there like a player that you can incorporate into the app? We outsource that. Like I don't, I, we don't do app development at VR Playhouse, although we, you know, work with uh, Total Cinema 360 in New York, who does that. And and I mean, yeah, I mean, the file size is a big a big issue. I mean, Matt can probably address that better than I can. Um, as far as the app development goes, or mobile players, uh, we have an API that's open that developers can build on top of. So that's how we've been getting around that for people that want a more branded experience. Otherwise, I would say, you know, we are not white labeling our platform at all. So if you have 360 video or VR video that you want to play back, um, you know, you can upload it to our platform and then you can have a mobile experience and have your own channel that you can promote and have links back to and stuff like that. And then if you want a more custom branded experience, we have an API that, you know, any developer can use and build a full blown app experience on top of. And Total Cinema, they'll do it. Yep. And Total yeah. Cinema 360, our friends in New York. Yeah, and if you guys have content, let's just say an MP4 file today, you can upload to a website like Video and actually enjoy it via web VR. So I'm assuming we've all seen the articles about 
Firefox, Chrome, et cetera, supporting it. From your DK2, you can output directly from your computer. You don't need a rich client app, you don't need anything like that. You can literally just have your Oculus attached, enjoy it from there. Um, I think that you know both Litastar and Bridio were focused on being agnostic. Um, one thing that we're really priding ourselves on is to be able to have proprietary software on our side that can easily spin up pretty much any sort of shoots that you're going to be doing. Let's just say there's a new standard in six months. God forbid that there are continuing standard changes, but we all know that that it will happen. Um, we can spin up that support fairly quickly because all of our software is pretty much proprietary and focused on being agnostic. You submit once, it's available wide. All right, these are some great questions. This is exactly what this workshop is for, is so that everyone can get answers to all their questions in post-production and anything in our area. So please keep them coming. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, are any of you uh, involving um, uh, various 3D apps like Maya or uh, Max or something in? What are you doing? Are you doing complete uh, CG environments? Are you doing like set extensions for uh, live action? Or how are you using um, we, we're using Maya right now for the CG on the Red Bull piece, so that's how we're using it. Although CG is not VR Playhouse's, you know, specialty, but I, you know, Maya experts are helpful. Uh, I'll direct that question to John, but I will just say that uh, on our Gear VR app, we do have 3D support. So if you are working in 3D, we support that playback and we're testing on um, web and mobile right now for that. And um, also a, a nice cheap option is Blender has a, uh, a 360 degree camera so you can uh, output really easily. Yeah, Max and, uh, Max and Maya and have the default mental ray has a 360 degree render. I think V-Ray has one too. Um, Octane Render has just released Octane VR for free for three months if you want to render um, directly to that. And they will be supporting animation output and light field output. Um, which is kind of a step beyond this. Um, and then the other option is to use a 3D engine, which is what we're doing. Um, and then if you want to have live action integrated in that, that's actually quite easy. And the quality that you'll get is will be higher because you can put, you can assign all of the resolution of the video that you can play back to a much smaller part of the frame. So you're not stretching a 4K video around your entire field of view, or if it's in 3D, half of your, you know, you have to divide that by two, so you can only do 2K. Um, but if you're doing a game engine integration, you can actually take the video and put it, uh, you know, put it down into just a, a, a billboard and have an actor in that billboard, and so you can have a much, much better resolution. The other advantage of that is um, with a two camera rig, you can be pretty much any distance down to a foot away from your subject. So. Uh, that you can get much closer to your subject, so that's that's an interesting advantage as well, storytelling wise, and it's it's also very compelling. You know, it makes the three D effect very compelling again because it's much closer to you. What do you mean by two, by two camera? Well, you have a, a camera where your eyes are, so you have one for your right eye, one for your left eye, and then a wide angle lens on them. Um, then you're not you, you're no longer dealing with stitching, and so you've avoided this whole yeah. massive problems that comes with trying to stitch a full panorama for yeah, multiple cameras. Um, yeah, right now I'm using the um, just the uh, default GoPro lens, which is 135 degree field of view. Um, and a lot of people, you can get a 180 degree lenses for them as well. And a lot of people have been experimenting with that and getting really cool results. Specular theory is uh, an example of that. I don't know if they're using GoPros, but they're doing 180 degree lenses. Yeah, there's a company, um, iZigger out of Hong Kong, that has uh, GoPro lenses, fisheye lenses, and they have a two camera rig that you, but you have to break out your other lenses and then put put it uh, the fisheye lenses in. And it, from what I've seen, it looks good. And obviously, two is a lot less work than six. So we've got time for one last quick question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I mean, currently, if you go to video.com, it's the word video with an R next to the V, so video. Um, you can submit, it's a similar UI experience um, to what you're used to with, like, let's say, a YouTuber Vimeo upload button, you upload. 
provide descriptions, et cetera. So the distribution that is currently available on our platform, uh, we fully support WebVR, so if you have an Oculus DK2, DK1, you can enjoy it straight from the website, no need for any, any additional support. Um, in addition, uh, you can if you have an Android device with Chrome or Firefox, you can enjoy it straight, literally the VR version, you can throw it in a cardboard, you can enjoy it straight from your mobile device. Um, in addition, in the next couple of weeks, there will be some fun announcements for the mass distribution on certain uh, native applications from our platform. So it's ex super exciting. So check it out. Um, it's it's a pretty consistent workflow from probably if you're a 16 by 9 producer for, for that kind of platform, it's the pretty much the identical sort of workflow. Yeah, and then you can also for distribution, if you're looking to reach a wider audience, um, you know, I had mentioned our Gear VR app was just approved by Samsung. Also, like for video, you can upload your videos to our site. Um, then we'll take the video and optimize it for cross-platform delivery, whether that's mobile web. Um, we have native apps in both stores. Um, Gear VR, the Oculus Rift support is coming soon in our desktop app. So pretty much across the board. We have some interesting announcements coming up as well on uh, other consoles outside of mobile. So be able to distribute there. I like to say to producers, you know, you guys produce it and we'll deliver it. Well, these have been some great questions and a lot of really great answers. So I want to thank everyone for coming out sincerely. And let's get a round of applause for the panel.